welcome. Um, today we're talking about estate planning for the generations. This is a really important topic because I think so often we're focusing on those who are in their later years and what their estate planning should be. And we often neglect the conversation about younger people and the estate planning that's important in their lives. Um, and I would make the argument that everybody should have some sort of an estate plan. And it does change throughout your lifetime. So the will or the plan, whether it's a will or a trust that is appropriate for you when you're in your 30s and maybe just starting out uh, in your career or your family is not going to be the same plan that will be appropriate as you get older in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And so it's important to understand the different stages of estate planning that many people engage in so that you can see what is best for you. My regular disclaimers are that everything that I'm going to discuss today, uh, with the exception of a few things uh, regarding taxes, is going to be um, New York State specific. And also, this is all meant to be educational and not legal advice. I highly encourage anybody who's thinking about how to set up their estate to speak with an attorney, have a consultation, and see how all of this information applies to them specifically in their own circumstances. So I'm going to start uh, with the documents that are the important documents for while you're living, and then we'll move to wills and trusts, which also are going to apply for after death. So right off the bat, everybody should have a healthcare proxy. When I say everybody, I mean everybody who's 18 years or older should have a document that says if they are incapable of making their own medical decisions, who can make them in their place. This document is important because while in certain cases there are defaults in the law that allow certain people to make decisions for you, that might be the person you choose. So as an example, there's something called the Family Health Care Decisions Act, and it says that if you are in an institution, so let's say you're at a hospital, you're in the ER, you're in the ICU, something happens, there is a list of people who can make medical decisions for you. At the top of that list is a court-appointed guardian or a healthcare agent under a healthcare proxy. But if you don't have those things, if you haven't done this type of planning, then it would be your spouse and then there's a hierarchy. Now let's say somebody's in the hospital and they would want their parent to make their decisions instead of their spouse. Or if it's someone who has five children and all the children have a different opinion, they all have the same authority under this law. So it's really important to sign that healthcare proxy to say the one person who you want to be the point person to make all the decisions for you. And then obviously, if you want your family members to confer with each other and to discuss it, you can tell them that you want them to do so. But you've named one person who can step in your shoes and make those decisions. A healthcare proxy does not require a lawyer. It does not require a doctor. It only requires two witnesses over the age of 18 who sign, put their print, their name, their address, date it, and say that you signed in their presence. Um, it's important that the people that are named as healthcare proxy are not named in the document. And I would also want to make sure that they're not anyone who's in your family. Uh, so when I signed my first healthcare proxy, I was in the ER, I was being brought into surgery for my appendix to be taken out. And uh, a nurse and the person who was cleaning the floors, because it was about one o'clock in the morning in the hospital, were my two witnesses. And that's how I signed my first healthcare proxy. Um, it's very important to have that again, if you're over the age of 18. The, uh, along with the healthcare proxy is a living will. A living will is a document that says what your wishes are for end of life treatment. And usually what we say in a healthcare, in a living will is something along the lines of my agent knows my wishes regarding artificial nutrition and hydration, and I am allowing them to withhold or withdraw treatment if they are told by a doctor that I'm in an irreversible state with no reasonable expectation of recovery. Now, we can obviously be very specific in that document or more general, and that's where we discuss with clients what they want in the document. Again, though, you don't need a lawyer and you don't need a doctor. You just need those same two witnesses. Those documents are in effect if you can't speak for yourself and if you're incapacitated as determined by a doctor. 
Along with those often goes a HIPAA release form. Now, HIPAA is the healthcare law that allows you healthcare privacy. So if you want a family member to have information about your, your uh, treatment or the options, and you want them to be able to speak with the doctor, you can authorize the doctor or other medical professionals to speak with certain individuals through a HIPAA release form. This does not need witnesses. It does not need a notary. You just sign it and date it. And that can be in effect while you still have capacity. So think of the person who goes to the doctor and then when they get home, maybe a family member wants to call and talk to the doctor to try and help you make a decision that the doctor can speak to them with that HIPAA release. That's you authorizing them to release information to those individuals. And so those are the healthcare documents. I'm gonna pause for a minute here and see if there's any question about those healthcare documents before I move forward. Uh, while I'm waiting to see if there are questions, I'll also briefly mention a MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T. It's Medical Orders of Life Sustaining Treatment. That is a physician's order. So that is actually a form that requires your doctor. It's often signed as people are older and are either at the end of life or have a terminal diagnosis. And it more, more detailed, uh, has a more detailed description of someone's wishes regarding end of life treatment, when to be brought to a hospital, et cetera. And that's something that you actually fill out with your doctor. And it's also signed by the doctor. It is a medical order as opposed to what we call these other documents that we do, which is called an advanced directive because you're signing in advance of needing it. Okay, I don't see any questions on the medical, so I will move on to power of attorney. A power of attorney is a document that allows an agent to handle certain financial and business matters of your life for you. Now, exactly what a power of attorney agent can do depends on what powers you give them in the document. So the document can be limited in scope. It could give very limited powers, maybe just that somebody can access your checking account and pay bills from it. Or it could be much broader, allowing them to move assets around, put assets into a trust for you, create a trust for your benefit or the benefit of another, um, do Medicaid planning, all sorts of things. And so when we sit with a client and we discuss the power of attorney, we talk about how extensive they feel comfortable making those powers. And this is where someone might feel much more comfortable as they get older, giving additional powers because they're worried about incapacity. They're worried that um, it's getting more difficult for them to handle their own affairs, as opposed to a younger person who does not want somebody else to have access to their accounts. Um, so that is really going to be person specific, how we create that document and what goes into it. It requires two witnesses, and one of those witnesses can also be the notary because we need the signature to be notarized. If I'm signing a power of attorney naming another individual to act on my behalf, my signature is has the two witnesses and is notarized, and the individual that I'm naming will need to sign and have it notarized prior to them being able to act with the document. There's no requirement that that person sign the document any time uh, in, in any certain increment after I sign. So I could sign a power of attorney now, have it witnessed and notarized, and it's in effect. However, my agent can't use it until they subsequently sign it and have it notarized. So many people like to sign the document and then keep it themselves with their agent knowing that if something should happen, that they can go and retrieve the document and sign it and bring it to the bank or whatever institution they need to accept it so they can act on someone's behalf. Some of the other powers that we often include are powers to handle uh, long-term care insurance, uh, other types of health insurance, pension plans, retirement assets, um, it's real property if somebody has a home that's not that they need to sell or mortgage. So I always describe it as the business of your life. And you're you're giving certain powers, allowing another person to handle certain areas of the business of your life. Um, I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions. I see that there is a healthcare related question here. Um, 
Uh, do I need both a living will and a healthcare proxy? So sometimes I see people who have a healthcare proxy and living will. Um, however, we, we prefer in our office to do them as two separate documents. Um, but I'll tell you the difference. The healthcare proxy names a person and then can also say that that person has the right to withhold or withdraw treatment. Usually our healthcare proxy, um, our living will, will go further than the, the living, uh, I apologize. Usually our living will will go further than the healthcare proxy in describing the types of treatments that can be withheld or withdrawn. And sometimes we don't want to give over the living will right away to the medical professionals. We want the agent under the healthcare proxy to keep that in their back pocket because they're not ready to withdraw the treatment yet. So while you can have a healthcare proxy with the language included from the living will, uh, we usually prefer practice-wise to keep them separate. Are there any other questions about the, oh, we have some more coming in. Okay. So what's the difference between a durable POA and a medical POA? That's a good question. So in New York, we don't use the term medical power of attorney. Other states do, is my understanding. In New York, the medical POA, that's the same concept as the healthcare proxy. So it's naming who is to make those decisions on your behalf. The term durable power of attorney, we actually don't use the term durable in the power of attorney anymore, but a power of attorney in New York signals the financial and business document that I described, and all powers of attorney are deemed to be durable unless they state otherwise. And durable just means that it's in effect now and also if I become incapacitated. So um, I could go into a long history of the power of attorney document doesn't seem necessary, but just know that unless your power of attorney says this is not durable, the default is that it is durable, meaning it's in effect if you become incapacitated as well as right now. <clears throat> if you move states, you need to redo all of the documents. So I generally recommend that if somebody is going to move permanently from one state to another, or if they truly split their time in two places, that they seek legal advice in the new state to determine if there's things that should be done. So for example, we have a lot of clients that go to Florida. So generally, if they're going to Florida to spend you know, six months out of the year or certainly full time, I recommend that when they get there, they have their New York state documents reviewed by a Florida attorney so that that attorney can give you advice on those documents. I will tell you that when someone comes here, if they have moved from another state, what I'm generally looking at to determine if they need new documents or different documents is what is going to be the ease of acceptance of those documents in New York State. So when you have a healthcare proxy and the healthcare proxy refers to the New York public health law, a hospital or doctor or other medical professional in New York knows what that means. But now if you have a document that's referring to a different state statute, you could sometimes run into uh, slowness or hurdles in getting that document accepted. So I generally like people, especially in the case of an emergency of a healthcare decision, to have the path of least resistance. And I would probably recommend a new healthcare proxy in the new state. Okay, so those are our current questions. So I'll keep moving now. Um, so moving on from the living documents. So we talked about the healthcare proxy, the living will, the HIPAA release form, the power of attorney. Now we'll move into more traditional estate planning documents, a will and a trust. Um, a trust is in effect while you're alive. A living trust is in effect while you're alive and after your death. But I'm going to discuss that after I talk about the will. So a will is a document that states how your assets should be distributed at your death and who is in charge of that. That person is called the executor. In your will, you are nominating an executor and you're stating your wishes for how your assets should be distributed who should they should go to and how they should be distributed. Will they get an outright gift? Will they get a gift in trust? Will they get property like a house or will they get the cash equivalent? This is all laid out in your last will and testament. But note, I said that your executor is only a nominated executor. Why? Because a last will and testament isn't worth more than the paper it's written on until it goes through a process called probate. 
This is one of the most common misconceptions that we have about wills and probate. Most people think that if you have a good will, then you avoid probate, and that's not the case. A will needs probate, probate needs a will. You can't have one without the other. So the probate process is the process of the will being presented to the court with a petition by the nominated executor usually saying, we want to admit this will to probate. We want the court to approve this will, to rubber stamp it, to say that this executor is officially appointed by the court as executor, and then can go forth and do the work as described in the last will and testament document. The probate process uh, can be slow, especially if you're in certain counties, it is much slower than others. Um, I have colleagues in upstate New York who sometimes tell me that they could file for probate in the morning and have letters testamentary, meaning the final product of probate appointing the executor by the afternoon or the next morning. That is not even close to the case downstate, um, even in the good, or I should say the uh, more efficient or the quicker counties downstate, you're still looking at a few months time. And certainly when you go to counties that have a high volume, like in New York City, you're talking about a large amount of time very often that it takes for probate to be issued. And so very often we're helping people look at should they be avoiding probate. Um, the probate process requires notification of your next of kin. So very often we have people who come to us and say, well, I'm very simple. I have no family. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean simple in this context because everyone has next of kin. The question is, do you know who they are and can we find them? And if we can't find them after your death and your will has to go through probate, that is going to require us to hire a genealogist, to find who these people might be, and then to attempt to notify them. And until we satisfy the court that we've tried hard enough, that will won't be processed for probate, and it's more and more of a delay. And then you're talking about not being able to sell property because there's no executor, not being able to access apartments sometimes so you can't clean them out. And there's then you're paying more and more, you're paying taxes, you're paying maintenance, whatever has to be done to keep the property going with no one being technically in charge of that property. So we really like to avoid probate, especially in the cases where we have property, whether it's a co-op, a condo, or a home. The probate process is also difficult if you can't uh, not notifying your with with having to notify your next of kin. You also have to realize that if you're disinheriting one of those people, that could also be a problem. So, for example, if you have two children and you're disinheriting one of them in your documents, then they receive notification that they're being disinherited and they can cause a fuss. And that can be, again, more time and money. Also, if you have a disabled beneficiary, your disabled beneficiary, the court will appoint what's called a guardian ad litem. So a court appointed lawyer to represent the interest of your disabled beneficiary if they can't represent themselves. And a last reason why we like to avoid probate is if you own property in multiple states, and I mean property, meaning real estate in multiple states, then you will have to probate your will in each state. And so again, it's more time and more delay and more money. So take someone, and this happens very commonly. I have clients who are in New York City who are rent stabilized in New York City. Uh, so they don't even own property in New York City. They, But that's their primary residence. That's where they're domiciled at the time of their death. Their bank accounts, everything's in New York. But they own a small piece of property in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or Florida. Well, then their will would have to be probated here in New York, and then we'd have to have what's called an ancillary probate in that other state. So now you have the two probates in order for the property to pass on to the next individuals. So again, these are times we like to avoid probate. Um, the will, in addition to having uh, the information that I described for younger people who have minor children, a will can say, who will be the guardian of your child, who will take physical custody if both parents or if they if there are no parents, legal, uh, biological, or adoptive parents to take that child into custody. Um, it will say who will take custody of your child. And it will also say and should say that a trust would be created where your assets would go into it 
to be managed for the benefit of your child. Um, so for young parents, that's often the most important thing. Um, I very often have people come in and they don't think they have anything, but they have a life insurance through work and they might own a home. Maybe there's a mortgage, but they still own it. And they have 401k that they're putting money aside at work. These aren't assets that make them feel like they have a lot of money in the bank, but they are assets that upon the death of both parents would go to the child. And so you want to make sure that there's a trust set up that could receive all of those assets for the benefit of that child and can be managed for that child until the age that you say they can take care of it themselves. So that's a reason why a will especially is really important for younger parents um, because they have to say where these things are going to go. So I talked about all of the reasons why we like to avoid probate. So then the question is, how do we avoid probate? Well, we do it a few different ways. One, we have joint owners on assets. We have beneficiaries on assets, or we create a trust for an asset. So for example, if somebody has a checking account, a retirement account, and a home, we could avoid probate by naming a joint owner on the checking account, a beneficiary on the retirement account, and maybe putting the home into a trust. And now we've avoided the court process of probate. The assets are distributed at the death of the individual according to the beneficiary designations or the trust. If somebody has a will that says everything goes to daughter A, but the beneficiary designations named daughter B, all of the assets will go to daughter B according to the beneficiary designations. The will is not going to control in that situation. So it's very important when you're discussing creating an estate plan with an attorney that you're looking at the big picture. We call it an estate plan. It's not just a matter of drafting a will. It's really coming up with a cohesive plan to make sure everything is managed and feeds into the right place. Okay, um, so when you have a, a trust, a trust is a document, a living trust can be revocable, it can be irrevocable. It can be done for estate tax purposes, it can be done for income tax purposes, or it can be created to protect assets for Medicaid. Um, every trust is drafted in a way that has a specific goal. An irrevocable trust, there are many different types, but irrevocable just means that there is something about the trust that limits the creator of the trust in how they can access trust assets and what they can do. And so a revocable trust means I can be in charge of it. I can control it. It's my social security number. I can do anything I want with it. It's only an irrevocable trust where I might have a restriction. And exactly what the restriction might be will depend on what the goal of the trust is. And I'm gonna explain some examples. If all I'm looking to do is avoid probate, because I am a person who lives in New York, who has a ski home in Vermont and a condo in Arizona, well, then I wanna create a trust and I want to deed each of my properties into that trust. Uh, so that upon my death, it can be distributed without probate in those three states. That's the simplest version of a trust, a revocable trust. And then just like a will, it can say who the guardian of my children would be. It could say who the trustees of any trust for my children would be. It can say who is going to be in charge of my estate. Instead of using the term executor, it would be the trustee that would manage the trust assets after my death, make sure my bills are paid, taxes are paid, cleans out my home, maybe sells it and distributes it out, whatever the terms of my document say. A trust document says the rules of the game. So I always tell people not to give their lawyers a hard time about boilerplate because boilerplate is very important because boilerplate is putting into a trust document all the rules of how the trust should be handled and managed. And a good trust is gonna say how it should be managed while I'm you know, alive and well, how it can be managed if differently when I lose my mental capacity, if that should happen, and then what should happen upon my death and how my assets should be handled at that time. So it has a lot of information in there about all of the different ways that my estate should be handled at different points in my life and after death. An irrevocable trust is very often created 
the most the two most popular types are for estate tax reasons to make sure there's no estate taxes upon death or for Medicaid asset protection. Estate tax wise, uh, the current exemptions were in 2022 today. And in 2022 in New York state, if you die, each individual has a $6.11 million exemption. That means if I die with $6 million in my name, I'm under the exemption and I have no estate tax. So I don't have to worry about that. Federally, it's over 12 million. However, in 2026, that's going to go back down to about 6 million. So in New York, we plan for the 6 million number quite often. And in uh, the federal, uh, on the federal side, um, we can share uh, between spouses. So if my spouse dies and I file the proper reports and my spouse had a $12 million exemption they didn't use, when I die, I can have my own exemption plus my spouse's. In New York, it's use it or lose it. So a lot of times when we're doing planning, regardless of the age of the person, if, especially if we have married couples, legally married persons, we want to do estate tax planning to make sure that we use both people's 6 million exemption. Because if one person dies and all the assets go to the survivor, and now the survivor has an $8 million estate, there's going to be a large estate tax for New York State. Whereas if the first person died and we use their exemption, the survivor can still be underneath their own exemption, and thus we can save on all estate taxes. So it's important, especially if you think that as an individual or as a couple, that your assets in total are over that $6 million mark, that you're getting proper planning on the estate tax side to make sure that things are handled properly. The other type of trust that I talked about is an irrevocable trust for Medicaid asset protection purposes. This is a popular trust for those who are older who are concerned that the cost of home care or long-term nursing home care is going to wipe out their estate. And so they may put assets into this trust so that it can't be touched and they can receive Medicaid from the government to pay for their care while their assets are protected. So for example, take a 75-year-old person who comes in, they own their home, they own an investment account, and they are worried that they might need a nursing home. Well, they may choose to put those assets into an irrevocable trust so that after five years, because there's a five-year look back, meaning after five years, you can't transfer assets. So for five years, it stays in the trust. And at five years and one month, they could apply for Medicaid to pay for the cost of that nursing home care. Why? There's a five-year look back, meaning when you apply for Medicaid to pay for nursing home care, when you're in a nursing home, they go backwards five years from that point and say, did you give anything away? So if during that time period you had put assets into a trust, you would create potentially a very large penalty, meaning a time period that Medicaid wouldn't pay for care. So those that are concerned and want to do an irrevocable trust for these purposes should really be doing advanced planning to try and do that. That's not to say that we don't have last minute tools for those that didn't plan in advance, but you should see an attorney if that's the situation you're in. So if we do create the irrevocable trust for Medicaid protection, the good part is that the assets are protected uh, if you should need Medicaid to pay for the cost of care. Um, however, the downside is you can't be the trustee of that trust. You need to name someone else and you cannot receive principal. So in my example, where that individual put an investment account into the trust, that investment account, they could only receive the income and the dividends from the trust assets. They could not receive the principal of the trust assets. So when we put assets into a trust like this, you have to make sure that these are assets that you feel comfortable not being able to utilize moving forward for the most part. We can always get at them in an emergency situation, but that could potentially jeopardize Medicaid eligibility. While you can't uh, revoke the trust on your own, and while you can't uh, access trust principal, you can change the trustees and change the beneficiaries. So while you do lose a lot of control, there are certain instances of, of control that some, an individual still has over these assets while still having the Medicaid protection. I'm going to go now to questions again. Um, 
So one question back from the power of attorney was, how long can you keep your power of attorney signed and notarized without the agent having to sign? So if you go back to what I said about the power of attorney, I could sign it, have it witnessed and notarized, and I could hold it. And then if I become incapacitated or if I come, there comes a time where I need someone to act on my behalf, my agent can then take it and sign it and move forward and present it to act on my behalf. There is in the in the statute, in the law, there is no period of time by which the person has to sign. So in theory, it could be years down the line. Now, sometimes, especially with older people, if we're worried about the document being accepted, I might recommend that they sign it and have the agent sign it and bring it to the bank to put it on file, if that makes someone comfortable, to make sure that they're not going to have any issues getting it on file. But according to the law, there is no period of time by which that person has to sign just before they act. So can my mom's house be transferred to an irrevocable trust and the proceeds withdrawn by the beneficiaries for mom's medical care, rent, et cetera? Assets in the irrevocable trust, and then even if the house is then sold, can't be used for mom's benefit. Because if you think about it, mom says, or Medicaid says, okay, mom, you've got these assets in this trust. And if you can use it for your care, then why should we pay for anything? The children can be beneficiaries of trust principle. So assets can go to the children, but mom cannot be a beneficiary of trust assets. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to keep moving on, but please feel free to keep putting the questions in if you want to. Um, so to recap, we've talked about the living advanced directives, the healthcare proxy, the living will, the HIPAA release. We've talked about the most form, which is signed with the doctor. We've talked about the power of attorney, which is for financial decisions. I will point out that the power of attorney is in existence while you are alive and immediately extinguished upon your death. So if you are agent under power of attorney for someone and they die, you can no longer act on that person's behalf. We talked about wills and the fact that they have to go through the process of probate and some of the downsides of the process of probate. And then we talked about trusts, revocable and irrevocable for tax purposes, um, to remove assets from your taxable estate if you are over that 6 million mark, or for an irrevocable trust for Medicaid asset protection purposes. Um, those are the main documents that we discuss. One other document that I just want to point out that I think is important, it's called the Agent to Control Disposition of Remains. This is a document where you say, if you wish to be cremated, if you wish to be buried, what other special instructions you might have, and most importantly, who is in charge of your remains. If you have several children, for example, they are all technically, just like that Healthcare Decisions Act, in charge of your remains. And they may have differing opinions as to how your final remains should be handled. So you want to direct this and you wanna direct who's in charge of it to make sure that your final wishes are followed. And this is a document that can be signed, very often it's signed with a funeral home when people pre-plan their funerals, or it's something that we sign with clients very often. I'm gonna go back to the questions here. Um, what if you don't want to keep all of your money in a revocable trust? Keeping out IRAs, cash, et cetera, can we add to the revocable trust? Does the look back start again? That's a great question. So first of all, many people do not, and I would never recommend, mostly unless someone's applying for Medicaid immediately, that all the assets go into the irrevocable trust because you need them. IRAs, first of all, do not go into a trust. Tax deferred assets like that are protected assets for Medicaid eligibility. They're seen as a stream of income. So you would never put your IRA, your 401k, your 403b, 457, all of those tax deferred assets do not go into a trust. Your bank account, your regular bank account that receives your social security, your pension, that won't go into a Medicaid trust either because again, you need to use that money and money in the trust can't be used for your benefit. So you'll always have a checking account at least outside of the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. If you add assets to the trust, 
it doesn't start a five year new five year period on the initial assets, but it starts a five year period for those assets. So remember, the Medicaid rule is that if you are asking Medicaid to pay for your nursing home, they go back five years from that date and see, did you give anything away during that time? So if you gave put your house in the trust and then six years later you applied for Medicaid, it's outside of the five year look back. But if you put your house in the trust and six years went by, but at year three, you put an investment account in the trust. Well, at year three, now you're only three years at six, you're only three years into the look back on that investment account. So the house is outside of the five years, but the investment account is it. Because the triggering factor is when you move assets from your name out. So from you to a trust, you to a child, you to any other individual, not to your spouse, that's okay, but to any other individual, that's where the issue is. So a lot of times people will do a little at a time, but you just want to be aware of the plan in advance and how it will impact potential eligibility. Can I put my house in a trust if I am still paying off a mortgage? Yes, you can. Um, what happens if there is no will? If someone doesn't have a will and they have assets in their sole name with no beneficiary, there's a process called administration. So let me go backwards. When I was talking about probate, I was saying that if you have a joint owner on your bank account and you have a beneficiary on your retirement account and your home's in a trust, you avoid probate. Why? Because you don't have any assets that are in your sole name without a beneficiary. Those assets are all directed where they're supposed to go. If you don't have a will, it's a very similar process. If you don't have a beneficiary on that bank account or a joint owner or in your house is not in a trust, your estate will go through administration. Administration is a very similar process to probate. However, the result is that your assets go equally to whomever falls into the category of next of kin. So with probate, we're just notifying the next of kin so they could come in and contest if they want to. But assuming that the will is approved, the assets go to the people you name in the will. With administration, you notify the next of kin. And then when it's all said and done, they also receive the assets because you have not directed them anywhere else. So I highly recommend that people have a will. One, again, because if you have minor children, you wanna make sure you're naming the trusts and the, and the guardians. And then also, uh, if you have next of kin you, uh, who, in, that you're not aware of, or there's a lot of them at the same level, you want to say who's the executor, who's in charge, who's going to handle things. Um, okay, we have a question here about a co-op, so let me just read it quickly. Okay, so the question is about uh, Medicaid seeking recovery uh, from a co-op, but this could apply to, to any home. Um, in this person's circumstance, they are joint with rights of survivorship. Um, and so, no, met as long as that property stays as a co-op or stays as a home, and upon mom's death, if it goes to the joint owner with rights of survivorship like this does, then there will be no Medicaid lien on the property. Medicaid only puts a lien after someone's death if a property has to pass through probate or administration. So by having the property as joint with rights of survivorship, you avoid that and you avoid a Medicaid lien. The only potential issue for somebody who's joint with rights of survivorship is if you sell the property while mom is still alive, mom is to receive half of the proceeds in which case that could then be available for Medicaid and potentially make someone lose their benefits. But otherwise, as long as the property is still owned as joint with rights of survivorship upon mom's death, there is no issue with Medicaid recovering against the property. Okay, so I'm just going to wait another minute or so and see if there's any uh, other questions. Um, so please feel free to write them in. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, I, I think it's really important for people to realize that estate planning is not just for old people um, and that it truly is a plan. It's something where you need to talk about not just what the documents say, but how are your assets titled? Do they have a joint owner? Do they have a beneficiary? And how do you want them to flow upon your death? 
And it really needs to be looked at as a larger plan rather than just individual assets one by one. So I don't see any questions. So thank you everyone for, oh, we have one just last second. Um, for personal expense, what can you use for personal expenses if you're in a nursing home? If you're in a nursing home on Medicaid, um, your income is going to the facility. Your assets may be in an irrevocable trust. You are allowed to have a bank account in your name that you can use for personal expenses. You also have a $50 personal needs allowance from your income. The bank account that you can have in your name is the current asset limit is $16,800, but that's slated to go up next year. Someone's asking about another health form about end of life treatment. Um, I'm not sure what they're referring to, but the ones we discussed was the healthcare proxy, the living will, and the most form with the doctor. The only other form I can think of would be a DNR, which is do not resuscitate. And that is also a medical order to be signed by a doctor. Um, that is not something that you would do with a lawyer. You would just give your agent the right to make that kind of a decision. Um, and then there's another question here about selling a house uh, prior to death. Um, and so if the if a property is moved into an irrevocable Medicaid asset protection trust, it is subsequently sold and that money is in the trust. As long as that money remains in the trust and it the five years has elapsed, there is no recovery from Medicaid on those assets. Um, and, and a follow-up from the question about what resources you can use to replenish your bank account. Once you're in a nursing home and your assets are protected, you cannot replenish your bank account if you don't have assets unless somebody gives you a gift um, because you uh, your income will be going to the facility. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. It was a great conversation and I hope that you all have a great Thanksgiving.